from Microbe TV. This is Tuivo, This Week in Evolution, episode number, what is the episode? 82. 82. <laughs> Recorded <laughs> on September 21st, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Nels LD. Hi there, from LD Lab Studios. Good to be back for the 82nd time, uh, stretching into six years of podcasting action. Are you getting tired of it now? Is that the, the no? Thing I can't here? get enough. I can't get enough of it. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> and honestly, the live streaming that we're doing um, is kind of like been a shot in the arm for me. It's I really enjoy connecting with the community here. Oh, so good. Yeah. Glad to hear it. So no, feeling good, feeling recharged every time we do it. I, I understand you have a twivable paper. <laughs> Twiv twivable paper. That's right. So <laughs> is it twivo or twiv? You could do both, right? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, you're speaking about this other paper. Yeah, absolutely. So we just um had a paper advanced publication over at eLife come out mm -hmm. and um there it's gonna come out I think in mid October, actually. And so um and it's absolutely tweevable or tweev twiv evil evilable what or some combo of the two. So this is about pox virus evolution. Um, we don't work on monkey pox in this, but it's certainly obviously on our minds. Um, mm. And this really fascinating um, situation where pox viruses are sort of like gene collectors. They constantly gain genes from their hosts. They capture them somehow and so we were curious how do they do that and that was that's what the paper talks about so yeah if um you wanted to do a deep dive on any podcasting venue you know where to find me vincent <laughs> yeah i think that would be fun so it's a preprint yeah. out right pre -print, it? it's a preprint and then um kind of an advanced so it's through peer review and um they put out sort of the advanced copy the proofs are up on elif's websites open access um and then i think mid-october will be the official publication there's a um, complimentary paper that will publish at the same time from Stefan Rothenberg's group out at Davis, California. And then they're gonna, there's going to be a little um, kind of perspective piece to sort of okay. explain what's going on here. So, yeah, let's um, keep that on the radar. Well, we could get uh, we could get rich here on Twivo or we could uh, bring you over to Twiv either way. Yeah, whichever you prefer. I'm, Talk I'm about up it. for either. Yeah. So let's see, uh, who do we have here today? We have uh, our moderators, Les, Tom, and Steph. Thank Welcome. you. Welcome. Good. Yeah. For coming, keeping things civilized here. <laughs> That's uh, right. <laughs> we have people from all over the world. Barb Mack is from the UK, and she wants to know are you running a viruses course? Hmm. I would like to. Yes, that's my plan. I'm not sure. It's not going to start in September, it may start later in the year, but that's my plan. Yeah. Great. Stay tuned. Good news. I'll be Good um, news. I'll be announcing it. Uh, Andrew is here from New Zealand. So I I uh, outside the incubator. <laughs> this is very funny. There's a little bus stop, and you know they have advertisements on the side, and mm -hmm. an ad just went up nonstop. Uh, New York to New Zealand, starting you know whenever. <laughs> New Zealand Air, so I could just hop on a plane and fly to New Zealand. How many yeah, hours do you think that'll take, <laughs> Nels? <laughs> Ooh, that'll take a minute. Um, yeah, but you're on notice, Andrew. If uh, Vincent shows up at your doorstep for a in vivo podcast, you'll know what happened there with that nonstop yeah. flight. Yeah. yeah, I would love to do that. I, <laughs> I have always I was invited to New Zealand years ago and couldn't make it, but I uh, would love to get there someday. Also, want to go back to Australia. A lot yeah, of good both, virology there. Both great countries. I was. It's been a while. I think I was in college when I did a um, study abroad in marine biology, both in Australia and we spent a few weeks in New Zealand as well. Both the North and South Islands. Absolutely incredible place of the world. Um, just beautiful. Good to see you, Andrew. Welcome back. MK, I think it's from, yeah, Martha, if, if I'm not wrong, from Eastern Massachusetts. Welcome back. Sean is here. I forgot where Sean is from. <laughs> Steph wants to, a close-up view of the whiteboard behind Nels. Nosy Me oh, wants yeah. to know what scientists think about. What's on that board, Nels? Point to one thing and tell us what it is. Uh, well, yeah, I'll point to something that has a virological meaning. It's just right over my shoulder here in orange. Um, can't really zoom in. Um, just with my setup, but there's um, there's a fish there. It's meant there's a little cartoon of a fish in orange. It's meant to be a zebra fish, <laughs> and 
uh, <laughs> the action is actually in the jaw. We discovered a new virus that lives in the jaws of zebrafish. Um, the jaws? So, yeah. So Why does it live in the jaws? <laughs> we think it might have, yeah, we're curious about that too. We think it might have something to do with transmission. So if these fish mm. are, you know, nipping at each other and displays of sort mm. of hierarchy or whatever, or even like mating those kind of behaviors, that the virus might hitchhike a ride from jaw to scales of the fish. Sure. It's our working hypothesis. So that's one of the things that's cooking in the background there. Oh, nice. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Franz, Franz is from the Netherlands. Hello, Franz. Nice to see you. You're welcome. Tim, welcome. I don't know where you're from, but but welcome. Mm -hmm. The flight is 17 hours. Oh, yeah. That's a long one. I've, kind I've, of... uh, I've been on longer flights. Hmm. I, think seven, I think from San Francisco to, to Singapore was 18 hours or something. Yeah, that sounds about right, yeah. Um, 17 is not so, 17 from New York. Eh. I, I have no problem doing a lot of reading. I, I could edit a bunch of podcasts. There you go. So forth. Uh, Sean is from New Jersey. All right. Welcome Steph. Uh, so the, the zebrafish story, uh, we talked about on TWIV, I think a couple of years yeah. ago, right? Yeah. And that was a different virus. So that was, um, ah. right up your alley. So that first virus is a Picorna virus, a distant, distant cousin of polio. Um, this one in the jaw is, um, I don't want to give away too much, but it's, um, it's a super tanker. It's a massive DNA virus. We're still working on trying to get its whole genome. Nice. Um, and it's in, so it's in kind of small numbers in the jaw. And so it's been challenging to, we're doing long distance PCR sequencing across the gaps to get this thing. We think it's going to be maybe a 300, 350 KB genome in the end. Yeah. So it's a giant virus. Yeah. Stay tuned. Very good. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, Meister Murphy is from Berlin. That's cool. Welcome. Uh, John, welcome as well. And we have Arland from Framingham, Massachusetts. Cool. Rima and Luna are from Iowa. Mm -hmm. Joanne is from Rima. Oregon. Welcome, we just did Joanne. A, we, we just did an immune episode with two people from Minnesota. Ah. Uh, Minnesota State University Moorhead, yeah, and uh, and also a guy from uh, Washington State University. Yeah, cool. Kind of so the yeah. Minnesota connection. That's my homeland and my original stomping grounds. I grew up in Minneapolis. Oh, this is John who uh, who asked last year when I did the live stream virology course. The first thing he asked was, what's a eukaryote? And I said, go look it up because <laughs> I don't have time to do that. <laughs> Thank you, John. And John wrote me a letter here. It's a physical letter. I have it next door. Oh, cool. Said you Great. should teach a really, really basic virology course. We explain everything. I could mm. do that. I could do whatever I want because that's what I'm doing now. I'm teaching. <laughs> and, right. you know, I depend on your contributions to, to, to drive this, but I can do it. Nicola is from Italy. Hello. Wow, so, welcome. So Jan... Uh, who's usually on the evening live stream, is now in Italy for many weeks. And she just texts me pictures of food every every oh. hour, it seems. It's amazing. It's just yeah. gorgeous. Wow. Uh, let's see. Here's FFHG from Iraq. Iraq. Wow. Welcome. I don't think Good we ever had here. anybody from, from Iraq. I can't remember. That's, That's great. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, welcome, everyone. And... Um, Today we will amaze you with some incredible science that is a little bit of a departure. It's a larger organism than we're usually talking about. Elizabeth is from West Virginia. Uh, so I'm working. I'll have to pay attention later. Yes, you can listen because um, this is all recorded. Uh, Joanne exactly. says a really basic virology course would be awesome. Yes, it's going to be even more basic than my introductory course, and I explain as much as I can, okay? We'll probably do that in the spring after I do my viruses course. Oh, good idea, yeah. Uh, Gwen is from Michigan. I love to, to see where people are from. I know, all over the map. It's really, really great. And the cool thing, Nels, is that they want to come in and listen to us discuss science, and they have their own little chat amongst themselves. Exactly. And I'll Ooh, confess, yeah. so, uh, you know, I'm not, um, I'm still kind of getting up to speed, on, so I'm not following the chat necessarily in real time, but letting Vincent kind of curate. Um, yeah, I'm doing with, some every curating. Every time yeah. we get spectacularly good questions. And so 
um, anticipating that today as well. Um, and then, you know, I think once I'm a little more comfortable um, and maybe get another computer uh, here at LD Lab Studios, I could imagine having that on a second yeah. screen and, and trying to get in the mix a little bit more too with the conversation on the side. But I'm glad everyone's here. Welcome and let's, let's One do more thing. Yeah. Uh, Lost Laboratory, hello, welcome back. I'll be seeing Lost Laboratory in a couple of weeks in October mm. in Seattle. Looking forward to that. Yeah, and the wildfire smoke. We had a little taste of that here. So we don't have many fires in Utah, luckily. Um, but mm. the Pacific Northwest has a bunch, and we're, depending on the weather patterns, can be a little bit downstream. We had a couple of days, but so far it's been a beautiful fall. Hope things clear up there in and around Seattle. Oh, I like this. A basic virology course for basic people. That's a great <laughs> title. I like that. I have to remember that. Let me write it down. A basic virology course. <laughs> That's a good one. For basic people. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I and uh, Nels, honestly, I have a hard time understanding you, but I try really hard. <laughs> <laughs> I understand, well, Nels. <laughs> fair, yeah, fair enough. Um, that it's, uh, I mean, this is one of the challenges here is I think, you know, some of the technical specialized science that we talk about, it's almost like a different, it's like a foreign language. And so maybe in that sense, Twivo in some cases can feel like kind of immersion immersion therapy you might feel like you're in over your head but um i don't know i we're hoping you know to reach as large of an audience as possible it's all, always tricky kind of the shortcuts we take or even the you know all of the jargon all of those things but hopefully yeah. we're pulling out a few of the big themes here and that that can be useful going forward but i appreciate your point gwen and Hang so Les, <laughs> Les wants a simple immunology course to prep for Brienne's. Well, you have to get Brienne to do that because right. um, I'm not going to do that. That's out of my lane, and I strongly believe in staying in your lane. <laughs> That's why I yeah. have Nels with me because I don't. I'm not an evolutionary biologist, right? I can understand Nels. Very easily, I can ask him questions, but he's the one, and that's why I asked him six years ago to do this, mm. and we're still doing it. So yeah, yeah, learning as we go, and you know, I'd I'd say um, I agree, staying in the lane. Although really fun to poke our heads out into different lanes and see what oh, might yeah. be going on. Um, as long but, as you don't claim to be an expert and give people advice, right? That's what I was just gonna say. Yep. Yeah. And um, expert is sort of a relative thing. So, you know, the ability to navigate some of this stuff, but we're all kind of lifelong learners here in academics. And so that's sort of part of the journey is um, acknowledging yep. our our limitations, but, but in, you know, kind of finding ourselves surprised and in a new space, which is really one of the fun things about this. Thank you, Rob, for your contribution to science education here at the Incubator. Mm. By the way, you know, over on Puscast, they always talk about fungal infections, right? Oh, wow. Because yeah, they do yeah. they do viruses, bacteria, yep. fungi, and parasites every episode. And so, if you want to get your fix, go over <laughs> there. Very cool. Uh, Thank Nicola you. Nicola bought the second edition of the Origin of AIDS. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is by Jacques Pepin. Great book. Mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, I think we should interview the author on Twiv. Let me write another one down. Is it here in this in the uh, incubator? I actually have. <laughs> pads of paper they were sent to me actually by uh, a surgeon in chattanooga oh wow uh lisa smith dr lisa smith nice. and at the top it says here things to do and at the bottom it says not all heroes wear capes i think that's pretty funny pretty great <laughs> and under the top where it says things to do it says uh chest wall reconstruction program which really scares yeah. the hell out of me Yikes. i don't want my yeah. chest wall reconstructed yeah but anyway uh, what am i doing here <laughs> jack pepin uh twiv jack you know pepin, the, is it, he a sound, he's a chef. chef he's a chef but he's also the author of <laughs> the origin of it. it's, it's, it's very funny <laughs> all right um all right nels what do we have for today this is an amazing paper Folks. Yeah, really and, fun. And the, the link is in the um, the, uh, sh the show notes on the YouTube thingy if you want oh, to go fantastic. read it for us. That's great. So, yeah, as you, I think, were hinting at a moment ago, Vincent, I mean, we've been kind of really deep into virus evolution as um, we've been bouncing around with SARS-2 in real time. Um, more recently, we've kind of been uh, moving into some 
other critters out there, but mostly invertebrates. So we've been talking, speaking of fungi and other kind of critters like this, we've been talking about slime molds recently. We've been talking about, um, you know, insects and sort of all of these kind of things. But today we're going to spend some time with our own species, humans, and sort of one of those big fascinating questions that I think captures everyone's imagination, thinking about what is it that makes, you know, our brain different from the brains of all of the other mammals around us, the other primates around us, even um, ancient humans, archaic humans, the Neanderthals and so forth. So the title of the paper is Human TKTL1. I don't know if the shorthand for that would be Tectal1. Um, implies greater neurogenesis in frontal neocortex of modern humans than Neanderthals. And yeah, there it is. So this was published recently, just a, a week or two ago, a couple of weeks ago in Science Magazine. And um, the authors here are from a couple of different locations in Germany. Um, we have three first authors. This is Annalene Pinson, Li Zing, and Takashi Namba um, are the, the co-authors of um, a bunch of middle authors. And I'll highlight the final two sort of senior authors who are Svanta Pebo and um, Wieland Hüttner. And so the two institutions, these are in Germany, are it's two different Max Planck institutes. Um, the one in Dresden, which um, is sort of focused on molecular cell biology and genetics. And then Max Planck uh, Leipzig, which is evolutionary anthropology. And so Svante Pabo is sort of the famous director of the Leipzig Institute. He's, I think, originally hails from Sweden, sort of a shy Swedish scientist, um, but really sort of groundbreaking work in uh, isolating the DNA of archaic humans. So things like Neanderthals, Denisovans, other ancient populations. Um, and this has been, as we've talked about a little bit on Twivo, this has been sort of groundbreaking in terms of being able to even put together genomes of these, of this now extinct lineage um, of, of our closest known relatives, basically from an evolutionary standpoint. And then um, uh, Hutner in his lab, who kind of, who are, and um, um, Annalene Pinson, who is running the study, is, is in the Hutner lab um, over in Dresden. Actually, I've been familiar with um, Wieland Hutner's work from for me back in grad school. So he's sort of a famous cell biologist who has done a lot of work kind of in the basic mechanisms of how cells build compartments, vesicles, and this is in, you know, neuronal cells and neuroendocrine cells, and then how they move these vesicles around, regulate their release under certain conditions that can regulate a lot of interesting biology. And so, you know, to kind of set this up a little bit, we're going to be talking about human cognition. What are sort of, how did this evolve potentially? Are there genetic clues that we might tie to this? But I wanted to kind of pause and just kind of point out how, you know, this is sort of one of these Twivo themes. This is sort of biology or evolution at the interfaces. So you have um, kind of cell biologists teaming up with evolutionary biologists, in this case, across two, um, you know, institutes focused on very different themes. But when the work kind of comes together, I think this is like really one of those exciting Twivo moments where you can kind of advance the field in a new way, where both when, when two fields come together. Um, and so that's what really caught my attention. Well, I mean, the topic is provocative too. So we were really curious, I think, I was just sort of innately curious about, you know, our own intelligence um, as it relates to um, other species out there, uh, neuro brain development, how are our brains different from other species and things like this. And so we haven't talked too much about this on Twivo, but we have hinted a little bit at um, Neanderthal biology. This is Twivo 8. Everyone's a little bit Neanderthal. Um, this was, we were talking, <laughs> we were talking about the immune system and some genes encoding immune components, um, where actually it looks like, um, there's some variation in Neanderthals that, that we carry with us today. And so that was sort of the cute, um, title there is that, um, I think it's estimated that, you know, at any like two or 3% of our genomes, the coding regions are contain alleles or, or very vari genetic variation that was sort of donated or came through integration. So, uh, mating between our ancestors and, and Neanderthals in that case, that was actually, um, if I'm remembering right, Vincent, that was an in vivo episode. I was there, um, before the incubator was open at your office at Columbia and we, mm -hmm. we, we had a fun conversation. Um, yeah. I think I was on the yeah. way to a meeting or something like that. Okay. So anyway, we're, um, thinking about the archaic humans again. Um, but in this time, the big question is the evolution of cognitive ability. Um, and 
drawing a direct comparison to the Neanderthals here to try to really get sort of a fine tuned look. And we're going to see like down to a single amino acid change. This is a one letter change in the DNA code between Neanderthals and us that the authors are going to propose has some like pretty substantial functional impact that might help explain um, uh, some of our cognitive ability. Now we have to be pretty, well, kind of, um, I think, try to spend some time being a little bit careful about how we define cognitive ability, what that is, how the sort of results here, does how does it connect or how indirectly does it connect to sort of that bigger question? Um, but it really is an interesting topic. Well, now it's, it's not even clear, as the authors point out, how different Neanderthals and Homo sapiens are in cognitive abilities, right? <laughs> well, so because, that's, yes. <laughs> because we don't have any Neanderthals to talk to anymore, right? <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah. And so the, you will see this pretty quickly that the, um, you know, and, but I think it, your, your point is a really important one, Vincent, because we bring a lot of baggage already, I would say, into the conversation, right? We have this, we already have, or, or I certainly have these assumptions about Neanderthals. I mean, it's almost like we use the word Neanderthal to describe, um, you know, situations or people who we think are sort of less um, nimble or smart yeah, or skilled. Yeah. And so let's be careful there. Yeah. And exactly. And so, and then even, you know, how do we define intelligence or cognition or brain function along these lines? And so, um, you know, the authors are a little bit careful. So even in the title of the paper, they use the word implies. So the, the we'll see the action of this gene variant that it implies greater neurogenesis. The, the, that's a pretty measured term. Yeah, it's very um, interesting. It, it's a very interesting way to put it, isn't it? It implies a gene implies something, right? Yeah, it's a little uh, honestly. I think it's a little, slightly confusing title for me. Although I do admire that it's not trying to like be some over the top like this explains yeah, yeah. all of human sort of brain evolution or something like that. But yeah, but immediately it's again like I think we it's pretty natural to try to connect the dots all the way through. And so they and they do a little bit of that. So immediately you know they open up with this notion that what they're really thinking about is brain cognition. And so, um, I always, you know, so, you know, maybe to Gwen's earlier point about, it's hard to like understand what we're even talking about. The <laughs> definitions of words are, are important here. And so, um, and to John's point earlier about looking it up on, um, Google, I did that with cognition and found a definition, which was, um, you know, so cognition is the mental action or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding mm. through thought, experience into the senses. And so that's, you know, I think that's a, a, it's a fair definition and it intuitively makes some sense to me, but that's different, I would say, than sort of some of our definitions, for example, of intelligence or IQ or something like that. So, you know, certainly it's all related and intertwined, but it's really complicated. And so someone's definition of cognition or intel might be different than another person's. And so I always get a little... I don't know, just kind of cautious or my, you know, my suspicions kind of come up when, when sort of broad conclusions might be drawn about some of these really complicated behaviors. Well, I think okay. that uh, it's, it's so difficult to compare cognition that they actually break it down a, a lot further, and which makes more sense, right, in terms of neuron production. That's right. And so, we'll, yeah, exactly. And I think that's where, you know, their conclusions and the evidence, as we'll see as we walk through it, is really the strongest. But then, um, you know, maybe the setup is a little bit ambitious there, kind of takes us into this more sort of perceived space. And then your point is exactly right, Vincent. It's like, you know, well, we weren't hanging, we, the Neanderthals went extinct a long time ago. And so, you know, it's, I think it's possible they were, had just as much cognitive ability as we did or, yeah, sure. you know, or depending on how you define it, you know, it was, it was sort of different, but very similar or something like that. So what we do know is that, um, uh, you, you know, that actually are from, um, physical evidence, the skulls of Neanderthals and some of the bones that we've recovered, which we've also been able to gain DNA from, and that's going to be the key sort of linchpin in how this study got advanced. Um, but you can then you can compare those skulls to our own, and um, the authors point out what you quickly see is that the um, you know that skull size is actually about the same. Um, the shape is a little different, and how the brain might develop and be organized might be different. But we don't have the brains of Neanderthals; that's gone. They, the, the bones were preserved, but the brains were not. And so, um, those are all open questions too. But we can, we, what we can do is step back and then in broad strokes, you know, talk about the evolution of the neocortex. And so we're going to get into a little bit of 
um, sort of neuroanatomy 101 here, and I'll confess <laughs> this is outside of my lane. So if I <laughs> stumble over some of this, um, you know, that I wouldn't be surprised. But so um, it's just the mammals that have the neocortex. So this is um, sort of the um, the outside of the brain, often to, like the frontal lobe um, is the location here. And um, one of the sort of main and, and really the um, sort of phenotype or the the sort of details that the authors will dive into is this idea that, um, you know, the neocortex in its sort of deep evolution, including like all mammals, this involved an increase in neuronal production as one of the major events that sort of advanced the mammalian brain going forward. Um, oh, here we yep. go. Yeah, we're so there's so good. the outer six layers. That's the neocortex, right? It's a, it's a mammalian yep. specific mm -hmm. thing. And, and we actually... Uh, have done a little bit of work on this with Zika virus many years ago because it's the neocortex that's much thinner in babies born to Zika virus infected mothers. Right. Yeah. And the microcephaly is a consequence of the shrinkage of the neocortex. Mm -hmm. And as you talk about the cells that give rise to this, I will tell you what we found in terms of uh, the effect of Zika virus. Oh yeah. Interesting. Yep. Yeah, and so this would also be, you know, it'd be a fun topic to kick around with the crew on um, Twin this week in neuroscience as well, um, to kind of get really into those details. But yeah, you can for go our grab purposes, your buddy, grab your buddy Jason <laughs> down the hall, right? That's right. Yeah, he's just sort of one building away, but he might be kind of out <laughs> traveling at the moment. He's pretty um, prolific mm -hmm. as a world traveler, but, but yeah, maybe he's around. So anyway, maybe uh, the next time I run into him over coffee or something like that, I'll get his impression as well. But um, for humans, um, you know, we're talking about here. Um, so the cortex, um, the outermost layer of the brain is associated with, uh, sort of these high level mental capabilities that it involves in humans, like in the ballpark of 15 billion neurons. I mean, this number is staggering, right? And that's just for like a small, like, or one, not a small part, but you know, just not the whole brain. I mean, it's a, it's really, um, absolutely incredible. Um, hmm. and so, um, you know, the, as I said, for, so the comparison here will be, so we could, you can actually, that's an open question is then if we want to understand how is our brain different or how like the genetics behind or the evolution of the human brain from other mammals, what's the comparison you draw? And so the farther away the comparison, it gets complicated. So there's been more evolutionary time. So more things have happened, some of which might be consequential, others of which might not be. Um, and then at the same time, you know, there's just major differences. So like the mouse brain and the human brain, you know, obviously the mouse brain is super tiny compared to ours. The mice are also smaller. And so how does, does that scale in a different way, given that a lot of these neurons are dedicated to things like, you know, innervating our hands and feet and, you know, how much sort of infrastructure um, you need from that. And then we'll even see um, in this paper that there's differences in sort of um, the way the brain is, um, or kind of the uh, morphology of the brain. So the idea of the um, sort of smooth versus wrinkled brain, um, there are mammals sort of a divide there, and that will come into play between actually mice and then ferrets that have a more wrinkled brain a little closer to humans. Um, but I think what the authors do here, which is, you know, a really clever or nice sort of comparison point is to get as close as possible to say, instead of trying to make some inferences across these massive evolutionary intervals, let's look at, let's get as close as we can. And the chimpanzees, you know, are the closest, um, our closest living or extant relative. That's still, it's been about 5 million years or so since our, we, we think we had a last common ancestor before we split off from, uh, from them. And so we can get a lot closer um, by looking at the DNA or the genomes of Neanderthals, which was only, um, you know, into the, um, I can't remember the exact numbers. Are we talking about 50,000 years, something um, much uh, more recent, uh, last common ancestor, um, maybe 50 to 100,000 years. And so um, what's really made this possible to even think about these comparisons as we we're kind of hinting at is the fact that we now have, um, you know, genome drafts of many um, into the tens or even hundreds of Neanderthals, different samples that were recovered. Often it's the ear bone, um, if they find that, where they can drill in and actually get decent, relatively decent, um, intact DNA to put together these genomes. And so um, so the authors um, want to uh, focus on um, these differences. And I, I'm going to, maybe I'll get back. So I'll 
talk about the setup here in that comparison, and I'll get back to a little bit of the neuroanatomy here in a moment, which will be the sort what they'll zoom in on. But so what's it's um, not mentioned in the paper, but I th but from um, some background, my understanding is that there's something like so if you compare now the genes, the gene sequence of Neanderthal genomes to our genomes, um, that there are about a hundred non-synonymous changes. So these are letter changes in the DNA that end up encoding a different amino acid in the protein. And it's the proteins that the cells are making that are sort of doing all of the work of cellular life here. And that, that applies to neurons as well. Um, and during neurodevelopment as the brain is, um, you know, as you're in the, the fetus as it's developing and then um, as, you, as it then develops into an adult brain. And so um, what they did was say, okay, here's a hundred genes. And um, given that there are these amino acid changes, those could have functional consequences that could help to explain potentially some of the differences between um, Neanderthals um, and us today. And so, you know, I'm, I haven't seen that list, but I'm guessing as we've kind of discussed on Twivo before, it involves genes that encode immune system functions. Those are common, those are genes that commonly change functions as they get locked in these sort of genetic conflicts with infectious microbes, the viruses, the, the bacteria, the parasites. Um, but what they note is there's also some genes here with some changes that are expressed in the developing brain. And so that's kind of that becomes their prime candidate for a gene that maybe there was a mutation, a letter change in the DNA code and a gene that's involved in brain development um, that might explain how modern human brains develop differently or, or have, you know, if we really kind of leap to this conclusion, have um, cognitive um, differences. Okay, so that's sort of the big idea. And there's, we'll return to this, there's like 100 different candidate genes. The reason they pull this one to the surface or really focus hmm. on this one is it's sort of that gene is expressing the protein at the right place in the right time. And so what is this place? So this is um, uh, these specific cells in, in the developing neocortex. And so there's two um, cell types that they really zoom in on here. One are the so-called BIPs. These are basal intermediate progenitors. So these are um, neuronal progenitors, cells that will contribute to the neurons that will then be part of the adult, ultimately the adult brain. Um, and then the real star of the show here is another um, cell type, the BRGs. Um, we're back in alphabet soup land, um, but that's short for basal radial glia cells. And so the BIPs, those um, other, those intermediate progenitors, they divide once. So for each progenitor, you get a second cell out of the deal, but the BRGs divide a bunch. And so, um, and that leads to, so as they undergo these kind of stem cell divisions, this leads to sort of a pool of cells that will then mature to become neurons. Now um, those these this happens in the yeah. neocortex, right? So that's that six yeah. layers, right? Yep. At the very base, there are these basal radial glia, right? That's why they're called basal, and they're actually yep. like stem cells. They give rise, they divide, and they form neurons, and then the neurons migrate to populate the neocortex along microtubule filaments, kind of like train tracks, right? Yeah. And they move up. And we showed a number of years ago, Amy Rosenfeld. Yeah. And uh, our collaborators at Columbia, that Zika virus infection, at least in mice, mm -hmm. disrupts the microtubules so the neurons can't move. And that, mm -hmm. for that reason, we think the, uh, the neocortex is thinner in microcephalic kids. Oh, so interesting. these yeah, radial yeah. glial are the ones that uh, give rise to the neurons that populate the neocortex are really important. Really important. And so, <clears throat> you know, and as you're pointing out, viruses could interfere with this developmental biology. And so the question here is, could our own genetics, our own genetic changes, some of these genes that encode the proteins that are involved in the act, the activity or the action of these cells, um, could these really um, be in play here as well? Um, and so, so that's the setup here. And we've already, you know, there's some differences that maybe I was hinting at too. So mice, relative to humans and ferrets don't make as many of these BRGs. And so that already sort of points to this as like the key cell type and sort of stacking the deck in your favor for having a lot of neurons. Um, now, you know, we're kind of making a major assumption here, um, which is that um, more is better. Um, and that's <laughs> not always the case in uh, neuroscience and life in general. And so maybe we'll return to that later, but that's sort of the opening idea here. 
Okay. So then, so they've got, so that's where the action is in the gene, which I haven't said, um, it's in the title, but the gene is um, transketolase like one, TKTL1. I think I'll probably just call it tectol one. I don't know if anyone else does that, but um, it seems kind of rolls off the tongue. Um, and what they note is that um, two things. So one is if you look at Neanderthals, and it turns out if you look at other primates, um, at one specific amino acid position, so this is just a location in the protein of, of transketolase like one, and we'll talk at the kind of at the end uh, about what this the gene product actually does here and how that might influence um, this difference in the number of neurons that are coming out of those BRGs. Um, but if you look at position 317, it's a lysine in the um, is the amino acid in Neanderthals, other primates, but in humans, it's an arginine. And so that's pretty unusual that there was a mutation in humans, sort of a genetic hack, potentially random mutation that could have had some beneficial consequences is sort of the setup here for the um, evolutionary story. Okay, so they um, that's kind of sets the table um, for how they identified this gene, sort of got us into the space, got us thinking about how... <laughs> Um, you know, there's something might be going on here. We know humans make more of these BRGs relative to mice and other mammals. There's this one genetic change that's unique to modern humans um, that might be part of the story here. So um, they want to then, and previous work has shown that this gene Tectal-1 is found in kind of at the right place at the right time. And so they first set out to confirm that. So they just do, um, they actually get some um, human fetal brain tissue. This has some ethical implications. Um, I think this was um, from um, aborted fetuses, actually, and, and part of the um, setup here in, in, of the research in Germany. Um, using that, those, um, that tissue, they can ask um, very specific questions so they can dissect out these areas of, the neo, of the, what will become the um, neocortex and then ask, is that gene expressed here? And so that means basically you're making you have the DNA of the genome, you make a message RNA, which then gets um, translated into the protein. And if you don't have the message, you're not going to make the protein. They see it at the right place in the right time. And then there's other data sets that also you know, are supportive of the fact that you see expression of the gene, not only at that place, but also sort of at the right time when the BRGs are, are sort of turning out, churning out all of these um, neurons that, as um, Vincent was describing, are going to migrate and position themselves um, up there in the outermost layer of the brain. Um, okay, so th with that kind of in place as the backdrop, then now they really wanted to make a, um, an attack on the idea that that one change, that one amino acid difference, could have something to do um, with some of the neurobiology here. Um, and so what they did is they went to the mouse, which the mouse model, and you can do some genetic manipulations there that are really sort of, um, uh, you know, not easy to do, but can, can really give you some insights into um, how these ch gene changes might be influencing the neurobiology. And so um, there's no tectal one in the neocortex of the mouse. And so they express um, either human tectal one, or which is the modern human version, or um, archaic tectal one, which just has that one amino acid change, the gene encodes for that one amino acid change. And the technique they use is called IUE in utero electroporation. I mean, this is wild, Vincent. So they're- Yeah, yeah we did like, this. We did this too. Yeah. Oh, you, oh, did you? And you're with uh, Zika. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seems to me, I mean, I would love to hear what you like actually doing. It seems like not a simple technique to pull off. Is that true? Yeah. You have to uh, do some surgery on the mother. You have to mm -hmm. uh, open them up and find an embryo. And then you have to go into the brain and you're really- applying an electrical probe to the brain while putting DNA in at the same time. Yeah. But it act, I was amazed because we learned this from our collaborator, uh, Richard Valley. Mm -hmm. I, it works. <laughs> you can put yeah. plasmids in and they actually get produced. In our case, we had a variety of plasmids. And then we took out, at birth, you can take out the, the, uh, the, the mice and you can look for expression of the gene. It's really remarkable. I'm, I was right. amazed. It blew me away. <laughs> I agree. Totally remarkable. And so here, this is kind of this collision, this interface of the biology. So using this new technology, which is only possible, you know, in recent times, and then bringing that together with that one amino acid change that we have identified from the ear bones of the Neanderthal remains, we did, you know, you could do this experiment for the first time. And so um, they were just as Vincent saying, they recovered these um, 
these um, offspring of the mother mice and showed that they were expressing either the human version or the archaic version, H tectal one or A tectal one. And then in addition to seeing the expression, they also could go in and do sort of the neuroanatomy here. They could count the number of BRGs and note that there's more BRGs in the when they did the, when they electroporated the the modern human gene compared to the Neanderthal this version. Is amazing, it's four gene. times four times more, and there's no effect on the BIPs, <laughs> which yeah, are the ones. Yeah, that's actually a, yeah, that's a nice control. sort of comparison point. The, so that yeah. other neuronal type, progenitor type that only makes one extra, continue to just do that, and so that gives you a little bit of confidence that they're making pretty specific kind of genetic alterations here. And so not only is there that fourfold increase that you're pointing out, Vincent, it's also their late, so-called late born neurons. So it kind of, you end up with more upper layer neurons. And these, again, these are the ones that are sort of correlated with the higher uh, sort of mental um, abilities. Uh, so or, what I want them to do is make a transgenic mouse, right? And then give it some tests once it's grown up and see if it, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. if it's that's got right. better cognitive ability. <laughs> that's right. So that's where... I think I have this in the show notes for later on. It's sort of like a fork in the road, right? So you have these mice, strange mice that have more neurons, but then they kind of stop and then they ask, okay, well, what is this gene doing? And they actually go yeah. kind of deeper in um, versus I agree with you. I'd love to see it go the other way. So are you- no, I'm sure they're doing that because I'm you sure can, you can give them maze tests and so forth that would assess their cognitive abilities and see if it's, I mean- I, I, I love the functional stuff that they did in this paper, but that's also fascinating, right? Fascinating. I mean, if you were a little bit cynical, you might guess that they, those are, I don't think those are hard experiments to do. And so maybe they did them, but they didn't really see maybe. Um, a difference. And that could hint at, there's a lot going, like when you think about brain development, there's a lot going on and there's more than just this one gene or even this one yeah. set of neuroprogenitors and how that all kind of fits together. And so it made those mice are I wouldn't, my kind of working hypothesis would be those mice are, even though they have 4X, the BRGs, um, relative to the other ones that they're not, uh, or yeah, that they're not maybe that. Well, it, it might mice. be, <laughs> it might be lethal because, you know, it's a, you have yeah. a, a nice balance there in the developing brain and all of a sudden you put four times more uh, radial glials in, it may not be compatible with, uh, with life, so. Good point, yep, they don't comment on that other than after they just did the cell counts. Yeah, another really good point. Okay, so then, um, but still pretty cool, right? So there's the only difference here in those treatments are that is that one amino acid. So this is really reductionist biology um, and sort of highlighting that comparison mm -hmm. point to the Neanderthal gene. So then they move on, you know, so I kind of was mentioning this the um, to, into a ferret model. And the reason this is kind of useful or interesting is that, Ferret brains are really different than mouse brains. So we're all mammals here, um, but the ferrets are a so-called um, gerencephalic, a gerencephalic species. Gy gyrencephalic. Gyre yeah. Thank you. Gyrencephalic yeah. species, the gyrus of the brain. Um, and this refers to kind of a technical term referring to that wrinkled brain phenotype. So we have more folds in our brain relative to mice that I think are called um, listen cephalic or something like that, the smooth brain. In fact, when, um, a, when a baby is born with... Uh, yeah. Smooth brain that's lysencephaly. Lysencephaly, yeah, yeah, that's right, exactly. Um, and so there, I think the idea is to kind of just get like what happens when you put this, the this or overexpress this gene in the context of a brain that might have a little bit of the same anatomy um, as our own. Um, and so they do the same thing with the modern version. But here, I was a little surprised. I mean, these aren't. I, I don't. I'm not trying to be kind of one of those sticklers. that's like do all the more. Ex like these are hard experiments to do. I'm thinking, mm. you know, mice is probably reduced to practice. Ferrets might be um, doing the. I again that inner utero electroporation. Uh, easy for me to say, but probably really hard to execute on. So they just do the modern human version. They don't actually do the comparison to the Neanderthal version of the gene here. And so they see um, a similar result. Um, to the mouse situation, but we don't have the comparison here. And so we don't have kind of that nice um, specificity um, in this case. Um, but they do, this puts it maybe a little bit closer to that, you know, that the sort of um, outer layer phenotypes that they're describing for the late born neurons. It's consistent with that. I don't know that it really goes too much farther than being a little bit suggestive in that space. Um, okay, so, but as geneticists, um, this is a really powerful technique to overexpress something and see a difference. But it's also, you know, you kind of uh, get a little bit suspicious just because you're expressing something out of context. You're putting a lot more of the gene in some cases than might 
exist in real life. And so are you, is this, does this reflect sort of the real um, physiologic condition of any brain? And so as geneticists, you like to kind of go to the toolbox and take out another tool, um, which is to reduce the amount of expression to, or knock it out in this case, and then see if you, instead of gaining a function, do you knock out in a specific way that function? And so they go to, again, to the sort of great technology that's available here, especially in the mouse system. And they use gene, and a gene editing um, approach or strategy. This is with CRISPR-Cas9, so a gift of the immune systems of bacteria allows you to code for um, and, and express a protein that can right, go in as almost like molecular scissors and cut out a little region of DNA. And so they do this um, both using um, human fetal brain tissue, um, or actually I think that's, they go straight to the human fetal tissue, and then they're mm -hmm. able to grow um, these cells um, into organoids. And so, um, you know, again, sort of the ethical considerations here um, are, are certainly at play. Um, and so, you know, as you um, use this tissue, like how much are you really learning about the biology? I think it's worth kind of just keeping that in the back of our minds and um, as, we're, as we're stepping through these kind of experiments. So um, they're basically um, remove that gene with the molecular scissors and then measure how many BRGs they get out of that tissue. And the answer is it's lower. Um, again, this is not they don't have a comparison here. It's sort of a first, I would say, you know, kind of approach in order to, to tackle this. They then, I think, move on to a more maybe insightful or more powerful set of experiments. This is using um, stem cells that can actually be formed. So these are human cells again, but they can actually form an organoid. So it's like a brain in a dish, but it's, you know, it's not a full brain, um, but it is a, a <laughs> slightly more complicated a developmental process that's kind of mimics some of the brain development that you would actually see in a real live human. Um, and so here, you know, I think they can do some more insightful experiments. So they go in again with that molecular scissors using CRISPR-Cas9 and they edit, um, and instead of knocking out the gene, so it's already there, the gene is there and they have the, you know, the, the modern human version is there. They use this to edit and they actually put in the Neanderthal version. So they just make a single amino acid change. And so the fact that you can edit these genes is also just really Amazing. spectacularly fun. Yeah. Piece of technology here. So this is great because now you have a, a well-controlled experiment in a, in a useful comparison point. Um, and so they grow up these organoids. Um, and, well, so in the first, they confirm that they didn't just kind of mess up the whole thing. You got to like CRISPR Cas9 is incredibly powerful. It's also has like off target effects and can, kind of bring in some surprises. And so to kind of mitigate that, they make sure, first of all, they aren't like just totally messing up all the chromosomes. They also do two independent lines, both of their, so they have mock edited ones where they go through all of the technique without editing. So it still has the human, but it has a sort of the same genetic manipulation there. And then um, two independent lines of the archaic so that, you know, that you want to compare, you know, if one is very different than the other, then you're thinking, oh my goodness, there's probably some off target effects here. Okay, so they have what they call now the Neanderth <laughs> Neanderthalized cells, <laughs> which is a little provocative. I mean, it's just a, it's a single point mutation. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> it's not like a sort of the whole bowl of wax there. But um, and then measure the those progenitor cells, the BRGs, mm -hmm. and in fact, they see that there are fewer there. Um, they rule out that there's cell death. So you can kind of think of alternate explanations for why there might be fewer. It might, but, and so there's no, the cell level of cell death is the same. And so what this implies is that those, that single change, they're just not producing as many of these. And so the implication would be that, you know, the, um, our ancestors, um, these archaic humans, um, that we split off from that they, because they didn't acquire that mutation, um, that they made fewer, BRGs and that maybe this was sort of, you know, part of the story in differences of brain development and even potentially cognition. But remember, we, that's again, we're I'm connecting a lot of dots there. What we do know, and I think they have, I think this is a pretty compelling experiment in some ways, is that there are, you're making fewer BRGs um, if you have that um, single uh, amino acid change. Okay, so, you know, a couple things missing here, I would say, kind of overall in those sort of functional things. So when you especially the knockout actually, which I kind of glossed over maybe a little bit, but when you knock something out, sort of the gold standard in genetics to show that you have a specific sort of situation here is to then try to rescue it. You put back the human case or you could put back the archaic gene 
variant and see um, if there's a difference in rescue. So that would be as kind of podcast peer review. I would be <laughs> um, considering, you know, should, is that really, would that help? Um, probably wouldn't like, like in a revision scenario or recommendation, like, like make that like a contingent on the paper being accepted, just given they kind of tackle this in a few different ways. And these are really difficult experiments to pull off with some ethical considerations as well. And so anyway, um, pretty, I think overall, like they've got a phenotype, it's not cognition, but it's, um, but it's a difference in, in progenitor cells. So the kind of next obvious question is, well, what is this gene doing anyway? What is tectal one's job? So it encodes a protein, it's in the transketolase family. Um, and so, you know, a lot is, there's a lot of other work that's been done to define this. So this is thought to act in a metabolic pathway, the pentose phosphate pathway or PPP pathway. Um, and so this kind of hooks into glycolysis, the generation or the processing of sugar um, from our diet and environmental sources. Um, and then sort of the production of all these intermediate um, you know, metabolic products that then are sort of the building blocks that are used in our, in just sort of the daily life of a cell. Um, and so for tectal one, um, it, they sort of, you know, you can actually go and look at the, um, the metabolic pathways. I'm going to kind of gloss over this. Luckily this isn't, um, this podcast <laughs> isn't this week and metabolism other. So otherwise I would maybe try to do justice to this, but, um, they come to the idea that given where this um, gene product, the protein, the enzyme acts in the metabolic pathway is that tectal one is probably involved in fatty acid synthesis and that that mutation, that single point mutation may increase a certain flavor of fatty acids that are sort of um, the building blocks of these neurons. And so by having more availability of that fatty acid, it might simply mean that the, as the stem cells are dividing, renewing, making more cells that they have more of that building block. And then that sort of a rate limiting step that if you have more of it, you can make more cells basically. It's kind of interesting, Vincent. So, you know, in evolutionary biology, we always talk about trade-offs. So if you make a, is there a mutation that's beneficial? Is there also sort of a cost associated with that? And the authors do mention that, um, you know, tectal one um, in humans has been associated in some cases with cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, and they don't really go in, into depth in that, but you know, it's just, it's sort of intuitively makes sense that if you increase the proliferation or the availability of, or the products that cells could proliferate with that you could end up in a sure. sort of pathologic sure. condition, right? Like with, um, like, so it could be, you know, yeah, maybe, an accessory. Yeah. Cause you know, yeah, if exactly. you, if the cells are dividing, they need more lipids to make membranes, right? Mm -hmm. So this gene would be you know, associated with the uh, uncontrolled division phenotype. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, that's right. And so actually that would be kind of a fun future direction is to actually dive into that. Is that really a trade-off? So, and is it that, you know, maybe by gaining this um, sort of set of neurons in brain development, the cost of that is that humans are more likely, modern humans are more likely to have brain tumors for, than Neanderthals were. I mean, that would be sort of, you know, a logical. So, so here's a, an interesting question from Franz. Is there anything known about the frequency of the SNP in, on this position, yeah. do we have hints on how this mutation is prevented? So I, I think from what they said in the paper, Nels, that we are all the the same amino acid, Homo sapiens. There's no SNPs, right? Correct. Yeah, that's right. So it's it's fixed. It's it's swept through. The implication is that so given that the other so that it looks like it's a, a mutation that was gained in our lineage and our ancestors, as we diverged away from other primates and other archaic yeah. humans, it started out, this worked. And so that's sort of the evolutionary kind of implication here is that there was a benefit. It's, it, it, it's fixed. It's swept through the population. It's at a hundred percent now. So a corollary question from Tom, at least some hybrids were viable. One wonders about the heterozygous brain. Yeah. Great point. Um, Tom, I, that would be a pretty interesting. So, you know, when you're doing the overexpression, you've actually got, well, so they note that, um, for the mouse experiments, tectal one isn't expressed in those cells. They overexpress it in those cells, but it's overexpressed. And so we, you lose that. So there's no heterozygous sort of condition you would there. If you really want to do it, you'd um, put both in together, um, or think about, incorporating that into the gene editing. It's a really good point. So what's the, are there, is there an intermediate outcome? Do you get like, if you have half 
Yeah. Um, as much of the, yep. So half as much might not be fit. And they, that's why eventually the, most of the Neanderthal DNA got bred out, right? That's an idea. So there's also, you know, I, I, um, and it's that can be kind of an intuitive leap to take as well. If something sweeps that it was beneficial. It's also, you know, your first maybe impression would be that, you know, things fix by chance as well. And so that's certainly um, an alternate hypothesis um, that's viable is that this was, um, you know, that maybe it wasn't adaptive. It was just by chance that some of our ancestors had that mutation. It fixed and it just kind of carries forward or it could have, or it could have hitchhiked along yeah. with another mutation. There's all kinds of sort of more complicated scenarios. Yeah. I mean, I'm, my thinking is it was just a random change, but, and it, yeah. and it got fixed because it was beneficial. The question is that it happened in Neanderthals or, Oh, you see. know, yeah. or later, because it's kind of attractive to happen in Neanderthals, and then they breed with Homo sapiens, and then that gene, that particular amino acid gets fixed. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to know what happened. <laughs> yeah, so in that case, so, you know, yeah, so the I think the scenario you're describing is intergression, right? So the Neanderthals had it, they sort of donated over um, through um, hybridization or mating between Neanderthals and then with the, onto the lineage that became modern humans. That is the case in some of these immune genes. So that's in, in Tuivo episode eight, that was exactly the situation. The difference here yeah. is that out of all of the Neanderthals that have been sequenced so far at that position, it's always... That we don't see yeah. any Neanderthals that have that change, and so that sort of is how we yeah. kind of come to the hypothesis that, it, or you know, the inference that it happened later after the split, and that there, you know, wasn't sort of um, uh, integration outcomes there. But yeah, yeah. no, it's a really uh, these are all great points um, and really good questions. Um, I think given the activity of the enzyme, I could imagine a case where it could be an intermediate phenotype if you have yeah. one yeah. of one of each. Um, uh, and then having two copies sort of, so it'd be like a 50% gain in these um, progenitors or the neurons they produce um, versus sort of a, a, a twofold gain by having both copies. But that's that's just a guess. Yeah, it's a good question. But we don't see any of those people anymore, so they must not be competitive, right? Uh, well, we don't see those. We don't see those. And uh I don't know. I'm still, I think the jury would be out about sort of like, what's the really benefit? Is there a really a beneficial outcome here? Um, you want to be careful because there's, there's just, um, you know, rare kind of outcomes that could be non that could be explained by a non-beneficial scenario. So for example, if there's a beneficial mutation, that's like a KB away from this one and that fixes because you're like, you know, twice as likely to survive a yeah, viral yeah, pandemic, sure. but then this change comes along and it happens to make, more of these neurons, but we still mm. haven't, you know, we still haven't connected that. It's, it feels right that having more of these neurons could be useful for cognition, but we still haven't actually seen any evidence of that. We've seen more neurons and whether that's sort of a key, um, you know, advance or even uh, incremental advance in human brain evolution, I think is still an open question. It looks right, but you want to be a little careful. Not yeah. to kind of jump to, to well, you know, first. also... I mean, how many human genomes have we sequenced, right? Not a huge amount. So there still could be some heterozygotes out there that we don't know about. Oh, sure. Yeah. And I, and honestly, actually, I um, think they've impl uh, implied that it's fixed in humans, but I should be a little careful. I haven't like looked. You can now, some of these mass, I mean, there's a lot of uh, modern humans are getting sequenced more every day um, into the hundreds of thousands or even the millions. And so. Um, and you can go to some databases and look. That would be fun to just double check. Um, but if there's yeah, there, a there are a lot of frequency. there are billions of humans, though. There could still be hiding out there, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, there could be new mutations happening. This is, I mean, so this is important point, right? So evolution hasn't stopped since like sure, okay, sure. humans, and, and so there's probably um, you know some mutations out there in the human population today, as you're saying, among these billions that could be involved in ongoing brain human brain evolution. And so the question is just. Will, you know, I mean, if we really think about it from an evolutionary standpoint, will the individuals that have that variation, will they sort of have more kids relative over sort of a long amount of time so that we see sort of changes along those lines in the yeah, sort of future yeah. of, of human brain development or brain evolution as well? Yeah. Uh, th this, th there's a whole section here where they establish that this gene is involved in, uh, you know, lipid biosynthesis. Uh, they use their two alleles to show that, but they also have inhibitors of the enzyme that they can use in cell cultures and organoids to prove this. So it's really a lot of uh, experimental data, which, yeah. you know, 
provides a hypothesis, but unfortunately, it doesn't answer the burning question, which is, <laughs> does it matter? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And so, yeah. And just to kind of underline what you said, so they actually have, I think, some pretty nice experiments. So it's, um, you know, geneticists are always a little bit suspicious when someone uses like a chemical inhibitor or things like that. But what they do is they inhibit the PPE, that pentose um, pathway, uh, and um, pentose phosphate pathway and show that like in, if they have that difference in the archaic tectal one or the human tectal one, if you inhibit that, that difference that they see goes away. And so that's actually, I think it is nice corroborating evidence that they're kind of in the yeah. specific pathway and they're, you know, they're, they're getting a little bit closer to the mechanism. I um, want to show the uh, pentose phosphate pathway here because uh, yeah. I, I actually talk about this in uh, some of uh, my lectures. So when you take glucose and you, and you metabolize it to pyruvate and acetyl-CoA, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can generate some energy in that process. Uh, but the, the some of these compounds are shunted off, and the one shunt that we're talking about here is the pentose 6-phosphate path, or the pentose phosphate shunt. You yep. take glucose 6-phosphate and you pull it off, and you make precursors to uh, nucleotides that way, uh, and you can also make acetyl-CoA, which can give rise to uh, fatty acids here. So this is a very versatile uh, metabolic pathway, and um, uh, the pentose phosphate is just one of the shunts that comes off of it. Yeah, that's right. And then you've got the right, – exactly right there in blue. The yeah, that's our enzyme, it's, right? Yeah. It's, there's the enzyme. And so if you mess around with its activity, then the amounts of acetate relative to this upstream um, metabolite – xylose 5P, right? So you could imagine that you have different amounts of that, that then these are the fatty acids that are contributing or sort of um, in the mix when it comes to um, the uh, production of these neurons, as you were saying, Vincent. So incorporating these sort of intermediates into the plasma membrane um, as you produce new cells. Of course, the synthesis of fatty acid is also a complicated pathway, but one of the main enzymes is fatty acid synthase, which is actually... Um, can be induced by by viruses who require more fatty acids for membrane synthesis. And so I'm just thinking, I wonder if TKTL is also a potential target for viruses, right, to, to manipulate this pathway. Interesting idea. Yeah, that's – and I kind of love this idea too of just the complicated biology of not only sort of our own genes but also the hitchhikers, the parasites, yeah. the viruses yeah. that come in and manipulate it. And it might be for a totally different reason, but that could have side effects or outcomes on our – Actual, yeah. you know, in this yeah. case, brain development or other sort of parts of our developmental palettes. Yeah. yeah, really clear in things like evolution of multicellularity. That's not as simple as it looks. It's not just that multicellular creature that's sort of gone through this evolutionary path. It's all the interactions with the other microbes and sort of environmental features that are all kind of coming together in really interesting ways. So yeah, so this um, kind of brings us to that. I would say that fork in the road that we were kind of mentioning before, which is, um, you know, so what they've done is they've chosen to take a really close view and to go deeper into what might be happening with this difference in tectal one and that metabolic pathway. What they didn't do is go the other way at the fork in the road, which is, okay, well, you, maybe you have more progenitors here, but is what's the impact then on the adult animal? And so that could be more complicated than it looks like. It could be that maybe there's not, that there's a lot. And certainly what we know is there's a lot of other players um, at work here. So there's at least 99 or so other genes. And in fact, this mm. group has published on a different gene that sort of, they kind of use that same approach where it's like, okay, this is different between the Neanderthal and modern humans. Um, this also is sort of implicated somehow in neurobiology. And so there's another gene called um, RGAP11B. Again, a single change, um, amino acid change, Neanderthals versus humans involved in mitochondria metabolism. So that acetyl-CoA you were just showing us in the um, uh, pathway of glycolysis um, that alters um, the metabolism and promotes the proliferation of basal progenitors. So basal progenitors, this is both the BIPs and the BRGs. So they kind of, in the case of the tectal one, they just talk about the BRGs, whereas the BIPs stay the same. But it looks like for this other gene, Again, a single difference that it could also kind of be contributing to some differences in both these mm. um, sets of neurons. And so I think that hints at there's a lot more going on here. Um, and then, you know, in both cases here, we're talking about the number of neurons that get sort of put into play in the developing neocortex. But there's other groups um, that have been looking at sort of other, um, you know, not just the quantity, but the quality 
of the neurons that arise during development. So how many connections are they making? What are the connections between the different neuronal cell types? What are the locations? So as they're grabbing, as those processes are grabbing onto microtubules and moving through the layers of the developing brain, um, where they end up could have a big outcome on and how they kind of get wired. And so in that case, you could have, you know, basically the same size brain, um, the same number of neurons even, but very different outcomes in terms of how that wiring then kind of influences the mental capacity or abilities of the um, adult brain in those cases, the, the human brain. So this is, I think it's tough. I mean, I'm like, I'm a big fan of this reductionist approach. And I think, you know, I, I really do like that they're taking that kind of highlighting that list of changes and using that to prioritize, to make that really close comparison, just sort of a blink of an eye of our evolutionary history. But it always sort of, it's like, okay, but there was more going on here. It was more complicated. How do these sort of things play together? whether it's the number of neurons or the quality of them or the location. And to me, at least as a non-neuroscientist, I think that it's like fascinating, but also sort of signals that there's so mm. much work yeah. to be done here in the field to really get at this. And, and when, and then when we add not just sort of the, you know, development in one generation, but then how has this sort of developed over 600,000 years of evolutionary time, then it really sort of comes into focus how complicated um, the question is. I mean, it's a great ambitious, daring, bold question to tackle but then it's like you know if you're gonna climb a massive mountain it still feels like we're sort of just at the very first steps along the journey in some sense let's do a couple of questions here yeah good idea. marco says is there a relationship between having some neanderthal genes and covid2 <laughs> sars cov2 infection yeah so that's um that's possible, actually. So going back to Twevo 8, we're, the gene in particular, this variant is of oligoadenylate synthase 1, OAS1 is the gene. And um, a couple of groups have tied a variant in OAS1 um, that actually has a, a little bit of a fatty acid connection, actually. So um, a prenyl group can be added to the protein OAS1, which then changes the location of this um, enzyme. So the job of OS1 is it actually um, binds to foreign double-strand RNA from viruses mm -hmm. like co uh, SARS-CoV-2 or other coronaviruses. Um, it, when it does that, it becomes active. It makes this second messenger, this funny small nucleotide. It takes ATPs and it hooks them together in a strange way. Um, and then that tickles a different enzyme called RNAzel, which is a enzyme that chews up RNA for a living. And when you, that's pretty, it's a pretty drastic step to take in the cytoplasm because you start chopping up ribosomal RNA, the ribosomes that produce proteins start to crash out. The virus RNA mm. might be getting chewed up. And so anyway, um, it turns out that um, variant that put OAS in this, prenylated it and, or helps to prenylate it and put it in this location actually has been um, linked or associated with um, a slightly better outcome with being infected with SARS-2. So the answer is yes <laughs> well <laughs> this this particular study oh or maybe the answer is no it's the, the, it, is, uh, some of the <laughs> neanderthal genes are associated with severe outcomes i see right yeah, so work in both ways yeah this one we did this on twiv 676 tragic gene flow from neanderthals cool yeah. yep could work yeah, in both directions right. yeah could uh, uh, very interesting right yeah um let's see Okay, here Franz says, uh, is it known what the things are that fix? Assuming the position is not immune from mutations, does it change here perhaps deadly during development? Yeah, it's a good, yeah, great question. And the answer to that is in most cases, yes. So very, like, so, and this is um, the notion that most random mutations are deleterious. So if you change a letter in something that has sort of an important or essential job in the cell, mm. A lot of those essential functions are sort of non-negotiable. And so when a mutation arises there, if it breaks the ability of the gene to encode a protein that works, that's not going to be viable. And so that won't kind of continue on um, through an evolutionary path. This is often referred to as purifying selection. A mutation like that that would wreck an essential function will get purified out of the population. Yeah. And that's sort of, that's most of evolution, honestly, is probably in that space. A lot of it is also a neutral space. You make a change, it doesn't really hurt it, but it doesn't help. It just kind of persists. 
and that's really one of for evolutionary biologists evolutionary geneticists that's really the challenge is distinguishing that kind of relaxed constraint as it's sometimes called from positive selection where there's a beneficial outcome those can look very similar um, in terms of the mutations the persistence of them but then discerning a functional difference a beneficial outcome is really kind of what you go for and that's kind of why the authors i think put so much energy into you know all these assays and tests to try to link this to this potentially beneficial outcome, which is having more progenitors, more and then more neurons as a result. So Tom says, uh, I was under the impression there are some human populations in some location in Africa whose ancestors did not breed with Neanderthal. Is that incorrect now? Oh, good question. My, I, I need to confess myself that my human. I mean, <laughs> I'm a professor in a human genetics department, but my human genetics is pretty limited. I'm um, rooting for the for the viruses and the other so, uh, critters so out Les, there. But, Les yeah. says, I thought only Eurasians had Neanderthal genes, but then Tom says there was back migration to Africa. So complicated. I think Nels would likely know. So you're supposed to know, Nels. Come on. I'm supposed to know, but I think I'm um, I'm in that camp of back migration, complicated migration, and um, and huh. I'm going to stand by our title from Twebo 8. Everyone's a little bit Neanderthal. Yeah, that's. I think that was the conclusion from that. That uh, from all the genomes we have, anyway, as we we're just saying, right? We haven't sequenced everyone. I haven't so. sequenced everyone. Yeah, and there are really big differences in population migrations in those histories. And so, um, uh, but the Neanderthals were pretty successful. Other, um, yeah, archaic humans as well. And there is a lot of sort of um, integration, a lot of interactions there. All right. That's it for our questions for now. That was great. Yeah. This is a kind of a kind of an unrelated one, but nevertheless, do you think mosquitoes hmm. carrying in viruses can shift species evolution for better or worse? <laughs> yeah, I love this is great. So um I think the answer is yes, better or worse. So this yeah. is like so now, you know, and this idea of this kind of hints at this idea of horizontal gene transfer. So can genes move so um, viruses carry genes as they replicate. And um, as viruses move between hosts, that means that you have different genes showing up nearby the genomes of the different hosts. Mm -hmm. um, and then actually, so that paper that we're just publishing in eLife uh, makes a case that there's um, that viruses are gaining genes from their hosts, then they move between different hosts. And then the next question, one of the questions we're really excited about, still working on, just kind of getting going on is, can you see the next step where the virus yep. gene yep. then goes into a different host. And there's a little bit of evidence out there that that does happen. And these are rare events, but the more you have these collisions, whether it's a mosquito moving a virus between two hosts, different species, um, other vectors, just viruses themselves moving between different hosts, like through air or other means carried by intermediate hosts, et cetera, that the genetics can get more complicated. It can get more interesting. And so, yeah, I think it can shift evolution. Yeah. All right, so now Elizabeth says, I understand that there are some populations with no Neanderthal DNA. That could be. I mean, I can imagine that there's some, um, you know, that there's some populations, probably in Africa in particular, that just haven't, you know, there's, so there, I think there is, there are certainly cases of back migration. So out of Africa, back into Africa, but does that cover all of Africa? Um, perhaps not. And, and some really isolated. Um, so we had, I can't remember the Tuivo, we, we've um, had some work from Sarah Tishkoff that we've covered. Um, mm -hmm. And she's one of the real world experts, one of the leaders in, go, in collecting DNA from different um, populations in Africa and has really pointed out how the genetics there is um, is really diverse and interesting and sort of, I think, underappreciated in some cases. I mean, more appreciated as we're doing more sampling, but it's really, there's a lot going on. All right, genetics. so I'm looking this up and here I have a 2020 report that says uh, a new study says everybody has a little bit of Neanderthal DNA, including Africans who have been thought to have no genetic link to mm. Neanderthals. A new study finds this. Um, so um, there's more to it than that. Researchers from Princeton now believe, based on a computational method, that Africans do in fact have Neanderthal DNA. What do you think about that computational <laughs> method, <laughs> Nels? <laughs> Yeah, that can uh, <clears throat> take it with a grain of salt, I guess. I don't want to like be a like a um, simulation basher or something like that, but I do. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you can get predictions for a lot of different things, and then 
real life can be uh, more complicated or doesn't necessarily have to fit to sort of a computer model. So, um, uh, I, oh, I was also going to add, so there's, you know, you can also have, con you can converge on um, changes as well. So depending on the number mm. of changes you're proposing, you can independently come, you can fix um, genetic variation, SNPs or alleles that, um, you know, you could, you could be fooled actually. So there could be like, let's say a dozen changes that um, a modern um, African population shares with uh, ancient Neanderthal population. And it, you can get to those, uh, that variation through independent means where you don't have to actually have a, a yeah. you know, like an intergression event. So it becomes a number game though, the more, so mm. if you move into hundreds or thousands of changes that are sort of shared, then that becomes a lot less likely that it was independent. Then there's, it's much more likely that there was a intergression situation. Apparently that was a cell paper. I, you know, this is not my field, so I don't know. But if folks want to look it up and report back for the during the rest of this stream, we'd love to hear from you. <laughs> it's our Twivo live homework. That's right. <laughs> or in podcasts ahead. As yeah, well. for sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. Great questions. Great. Always and, good uh, questions. Observations. Yeah. yeah, I really appreciate that. Yep. So in here from, uh, oh, let's see, this one from Yusuf. He says, if... Uh, we detect proteins that are responsible for control of latency and lytic infection of HSV, herpes simplex, and we hit the neurons with radiation to initiate lytic infection from a distance. Uh, is this possible? Yes, you can You can take latently infected cells and, and even mice and induce lytic replication. It's a mouse model, which is... You know, herpes simplex one is not not the natural host is not mice, so you have to take that with a grain of salt. But um, yeah, you can do that. Yes, and you know what? What I found out yesterday, I went to a seminar. So historically, we said when herpes simplex is in latent phase, only the lat RNAs are made. Latency associated mRNAs are made, and they do not code for any proteins. They just encode for microRNAs. I went to a talk yesterday from someone studying Epstein-Barr virus latency. And if you do single-cell RNA-seq, you can find lytic transcripts that are produced during latency that you never saw before because your, you know, your technology wasn't good enough. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it could be that there's more than we think to latency, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely, right. I think from an evolutionary standpoint, um, I, one thing I would point out though, too, is, so, you know, thinking about a latent infection in like, a um, an individual in a population, if then it goes lytic and there could even be, you know, some knock on genetic changes, these are somatic changes, not germline changes. And so, um, from an evolutionary standpoint, that sort of whatever yeah. happens or that complication will kind of like, will kind of dead end at the end of the life of that individual. Yeah. And so that's sort of always worth keeping in mind too. Is this something that's affecting the germline? Um, and um, there's some really interesting ideas about actually somatic changes caused by retrotransposons and mm. how that might influence brain development. But again, that's from an evolutionary standpoint, it's really hard to kind of wrap your head around how that would work because you're not, you, there's no sort of chain of custody through evolutionary time from generation <laughs> to generation. <Yeah. laughs> chain of custody, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> um, here's a, a COVID question, but I think it's it's reasonable. So let's uh, yep. uh, SARS-CoV-2 is the emergence of variants driven by evolutionary pressure from immunity from previous infection and vaccines. I think the virus is just chasing its own tail. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's the pressure. Yeah, that's the selection pressure. That's the main one, right? Absolutely. From immunity. I don't know yep. about chasing its tail. I think it, you know, I mean, evolution is for the moment. It's not doesn't have a trajectory, right? Yeah, I would say maybe instead of chasing its tail, competing, um, competing with uh, variants all around it. And so, um, if you're SARS, the SARS two variant, the original variant that emerged, you know, in late 2019, and you know, and if you so kind of like a hypothetical experiment, if you took that virus um, and seeded it into a population with today's Omicron variants um, that are continuing to sort of spit out variants. Um, and there is some way for these things to compete very quick. That original version wouldn't hang out very too, would not hang out very long compared mm. to the others. Yeah, and I think yeah. a lot of that reflects, you know, the last two and a half years of natural infections. Um, and then in addition to that, 
the um, vaccine based immunity that's been gained as well. And sort of all of the that's it's a different playing field if you're a SARS-2 today, even from a few months ago and then certainly from a couple of years ago. So, yeah, that's sort of the idea of all of these variants that sort of have their day in the sun and sweep through the population. I like that. Have their day in the sun, right? <laughs> I think yeah. that uh, whatever changes, so the virus makes a lot of mutations and um, whatever changes could help it move among people more effectively. And certainly immune evasion is a big one, right? Yeah, absolutely. It and there's good correlates. Fit. That's right. There's good correlates of this, right? So if you take then, um, you know, the various, the variants, and then expose them to the, um, you know, I'm probably getting this wrong, the, bl the blood products, you know the, you know, the serum from various individuals that have either been infected, been vaccinated and boosted. Um, you can see, a, a, so the ability of that kind of complicated set of um, neutralizing antibody mm. antibodies to act is um, quite different between the variants. And so, sure. whereas it might be really a strong outcome for the early ones um, where, you know, the most recent ones, you, generally you see less um, neutralization in those assays. And so that's consistent with this idea. Yeah. So Rob wants to know if you could Neanderthals be reestablished by using genes that still exist in humans? <laughs> this is great. So there's also, you know, the, um, this is sort of um, a, a, an emerging field, um, which is a little bit, um, you know, be careful here. So it's this idea of de-extinction. So, um, um, I don't think anyone has seriously proposed going and trying to um, bring in um, sort of reestablishing a Neanderthal based on gene editing techniques. Um, but people have talked about sort of start, you know, can you bring back the woolly mammoth or something like that? Um, but it's, it's sort of not as like simple as, first of all, it's not simple at all um, to do any of this kind of large scale uh, mutational kind of, situation. Um, but it, it also like reflects the differences in environments too. And so I think um, Beth Shapiro at um, Santa Cruz is one mm -hmm. of the leaders in this area of quote unquote de-extinction, but it's worth kind of going beneath the surface here, kind of past the news headlines and into what are the geneticists <laughs> really proposing here. Um, and it's a little bit more kind of like, um, in my impression at least, is it's a little more kind of advanced zookeeping with a little kind of genetic twist as opposed to like reestablish using genetic engineering to reestablish um, completely extinct species. So no Jurassic Park, right? <laughs> not yet. <laughs> it's still still on the yeah. movie screens. Yeah. I think that's though it. it would not be ethical to bring back a Neanderthal because that's a person and then they may be yeah. screwed up, right? They may have horrible health problems or whatever. And I don't think that's fair to subject someone, right, to that. Well yeah, exactly. And it's I mean, so that's when it's kind of this news headline stuff. And so um, technically I don't think we're there at all. And then but it's also in yeah, and ethically, you know, I mean, we've kind of hinted at this even just talking about the simple single um, amino acid change is that mm. we have all this kind of um, sociological or psychological baggage of how we consider Neanderthals relative to our own species. And so I think you yeah, raise yeah. all kinds of crazy ethical situ like you're, you know, engineering a group of humans as, you know, sort of like a worker class or something. I mean, it just gets off the rails in a hurry. Yeah, and so yeah, um, yeah. I think the good news is the genetics is nowhere close, but, um, but that doesn't mean I'm not trying to like shove this under the rug. I think these are ethical conversations that should be had, but it's pretty, from an ethical standpoint, it's pretty easy to, to dismiss these ideas as just not ethical at all and just sort of a mess. So Tryon wants to know if, if SARS-3 occurs, does two disappear? I, I would say no, not necessarily. Yeah, agree. So the same way, you know, so SARS-1 is kind of gone as far as I know, um, it kind of burned itself out, but we still have different coronaviruses circulating. So OC43, which is yeah. now causes pretty regularly the common cold, that's still around. And so SARS-2 hasn't squelched out that other circulating population of coronaviruses. So yeah, I agree. Yep. And, yep. you know, what SARS-3 is relative to like how we name these things can be um, a, a little bit tricky, but yeah, if it's a, a very different, different coronaviruses, um, can absolutely co-circulate agree. Yeah. Yeah. And Rob says it, it's not ethical, but it's fun to speculate for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that we can do thought experiments are, are ethical, right? <laughs> right now, so. Thought experiments are ethical and ethical conversations are important to have. Absolutely. Yes, right. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's move on Nels in our last yeah. phase here. Sounds good. So I think we'll don't have anything in the mailbag this time, but nope. why don't we move to our science 
picks of the week and all great questions in real time. Thank you everyone for contributing to the conversation here. So um, maybe I can start with my pick of the week. I have a link to a Twitter page. It's also, I think there's a YouTube channel um, from this fellow. So this is um, a scientific illustration. It's the periodic table. So we're moving um, a hard right turn here into chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, and this animation, it shows the elements of the periodic table, but instead of, you know, like their two letter code or whatever, it animates um, the protons, neutrons in the orbit filling to match the valence of the electrons. Um, and it's just kind of a fun way of looking at the um, periodic table in a sort of a fresh way that kind of, I think for me, what it did was it was like, it reminded me that these like, you know, all elements are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And then it's just how many of them and sort of how they're organized and how they all spin around that then leads to the difference between whatever, like hydrogen, gold, all these radioactive isotopes, et cetera. Um, but kind of that, how it's united by sort of those chemical principles. And so I really like this as a way of visualizing this. And I guess the, um, author here is a fellow called Joseph Mannion. Um, and so in his byline, he says that he makes blender tutorials for scientists trying to get started with 3d software so that we can all have better figures. And I like that as a goal too. better figures and are illustrating science in fresh ways mm. to kind of, so it, it sounds like a good mission to me. So anyway, cool. Very cool. Didn't you a, pick, yeah. didn't you pick blender once as a pick nails? I thought you did. No, oh, maybe I, yeah, I can't remember. Maybe <laughs> it's possible for sure. <laughs> That's pretty cool. How, yeah. It's kind of a fun one. How about you, Vincent? What's your science pick of the week? Uh, so I have a, a site I discovered uh, reading a manuscript last week and it is called sick doms pulsen, right? Which mm -hmm. is uh, the disease pulse. It's a Norwegian site. Wow. Yeah. It's from the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. And it's basically surveillance of infectious diseases based on information from practitioners, primary care facilities. Um, they take 15 data from two, 15 different data sources. So this is basically a, um, a, a software package that does this. Uh, mm -hmm. And they, they give you two, two billion rows of data, wow. uh, 800 database ta tables, over a million analyses. Over 370 reports produced before breakfast. I think that's pretty funny. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so I guess the Norwegians have a um, sense of humor. So you can click on this about uh, sick doms pulse, and, uh, and it gives you a little more uh, information. And here you can do gastrointestinal infections. You can. It's in Norwegian, of course, but you yeah. can track <laughs> gastrointestinal infections over time wow. uh, based on these reports. And, and part of my... Um, Pick is also a web page where you can, it's kind of um, the journal article where you can get a summary. Real time surveillance system in an infrastructure coping with half a million analyses a day. <laughs> uh, it's developed by the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, and they take uh, data and they, they explain here. Uh, it runs half a million analyses each day, produces over twenty million rows of results. Wow! Yeah. And this is what you can. And a number of countries uh, use this for. Um, Surveillance and it's it's open source, so you could take it and use it to analyze any data that you do you want on uh, your own. So I think that's pretty yeah, cool. Very cool. And um, I think I was just reading in the news headlines how far behind the U.S. is in yeah. some in this <laughs> area, and how we could take a hint from the Norwegians here and get a little more serious about gathering and analyzing this kind of data um, for all kinds of illnesses that are circulating yeah. out there. Yeah. So this is um, it's the algorithm, and then there's a a shiny, so it's all written in R, and then there's an R shiny platform that you can use to build websites and communicate the data, right? So you don't have to do that separately. So basically a real-time surveillance system, gathering the data and then putting it into a website, all based on R. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Nice pick. Yeah. Um, I wanted to put one more question up here. Oh, yeah. Um, this one from Christopher, which is really a Q and a for tonight, but Nels is here. So let's sure. have him early in the pandemic. Small changes gave huge advantages to new variants. They spread rapidly. Now large changes are required to afford small advantages. Is that correct? 
Uh, I'd still say the jury's out on that. Is my yeah. impression that it could still be small consequential ch consequential changes that are just starting or continuing to be explored as more mutations are accruing. Yeah. Um, so I think both are certainly possible. Maybe because the a, the Omicron yeah. uh, subvariants have small changes now compared to the original yeah. Omicron, right? One or two or yeah. three spike. So. And they're, they're the latest one. I don't know, four dot two seven or something is 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 gaining foothold now with just like one spike change. So, yep. I don't that's think. Sort of, uh, yeah, that's sort of the next big question too. Are we in Omicron space for the road ahead, or could there be something well, else that's sort of hiding in the weeds that could come? I think we're still kind of you know hoping that things are simmering down, but I think so it's this is, th this is why I don't like the Omicron uh, specific vaccine. Cause I feel it's going to now push Omicron f further where right now it's kind of in some space that's not changing all that much with the, so far from the ancestral uh, antibodies or whatever, but now you put an Omicron specific immunogen in there and I think it's going to push it. We're going to see new variants, like you say. Uh, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. I mean, we're also, that's happening anyway as Omicron just naturally spread all over the place. It's sure. now making it. Sure. Yeah. And um, there was, it's not on um, SARS 2, but there's actually, there's, I didn't have it in my pick, but I would point to this um, nice reporting in science last week um, by Kai Kupferschmid on monkeypox. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, he would, um, not trying to pat myself on the back, but I had a couple of quotes in there. And um, <laughs> my, <laughs> one of my quotes is that trying to forecast where these virus, how they're going to evolve or where they're going to go next is sort of like shitty weather forecasting. Um, oh, it's absolutely right. You can't predict, you know. Yeah, it's so complicated. And there's so many factors and variables kind of swirling around here. So I was also kind of just on a personal note, um, happy to get the word shitty quoted into Science Magazine somehow. They actually put shitty in? That's cool. Very yeah. good. Anyway, <laughs> if you if your folks have more virus questions, come to the live stream tonight. It's here on YouTube, eight p.m. Amy Rosenfeld and I will attempt to uh, answer <laughs> questions. Cool on monkeypox, uh, COVID, polio virus, whatever you want, we'll, we'll tackle it. <laughs> All right, nice. Nels. I think that's time to wrap up another exciting uh, live stream of Twivo. The, uh, the, the website is microbe.tv slash Twivo, and um, you guys all come here. So we don't, we don't get many email questions, but if you're so moved, Twivo at microbe.tv. And uh, if you like what we do, consider supporting us, uh, microbe.tv slash contribute. Nels LD is at cellvolution.org. That's his website, and he is on Twitter at at uh, L Early Bird. Thanks, Nels. Good to see you again. Thanks you. Thank you, Vincent. Good to see <laughs> you. And to the crowd, thank you. This is really fun. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Yeah, thanks to everyone for coming and, and having a good question and answer and chat. And also thanks to our moderators today, Les, Steph, and Tom, uh, for uh, keeping it a nice, civilized environment and, and you know that music you hear let me, let me play the ending music uh, that's out. by trampled by turtles you can find their work at trampledbyturtles.com you've been listening to this week in evolution the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick thanks for joining us we'll be back next month till then be curious bye-bye everybody <laughs>